Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Engage, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, which is administered by U.S. Aging. My name is Meredith Hanley. I serve as the Director of Community Capacity Building at U.S. Aging, and I oversee the Engaged Resource Center. Our webinar today is called Serving People Living with Dementia, Programs and Interventions to Promote Social Engagement. During the webinar, Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center will provide a framer on social isolation and loneliness among people living with dementia. Pima Council on Aging and Gateway Geriatric Education Center will then highlight programs and interventions that help people living with dementia and caregivers to stay socially engaged. And all the speakers will share tips that you can use at your organization to develop, implement, and sustain these social engagement opportunities. Next slide, just a couple brief housekeeping items. All, all attendees of this webinar are in listen only mode, but um, there are still ways you can engage with our speakers today. You can submit questions for the presenters at any time. You don't have to wait till the end by clicking the Zoom question and answer or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Just type your question into the Q&A box and hit submit, and then we can hopefully get to as many questions as possible in the Q&A session, which will happen at the end of the webinar. There's also the chat feature, and you can click on the chat button to um, engage with each other, but also to message us as the host directly if you need technical support. Also, the webinar will be recorded, and we'll share a link with you um, via follow-up email in, in, the, in the next few days as well. Next slide. So for anyone who's using a screen reader and perhaps wants to silence unwanted chatter in the chat and Q&A boxes, you can activate the speech on demand feature by pressing insert space bar and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. Um, you can view closed caption subtitles, watch a live transcript of the meeting or adjust the size of um, subtitle text as well in this webinar. To control closed captions, you can click on the CC live transcript button in the control bar at the bottom of the Zoom window. And if you like, you can also notify us that you need technical assistance, um, either by chatting us directly in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand in the Zoom platform. Um, um, a, 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 um, I guess a quick step for raising your virtual hand is pressing Alt plus Y on your keyboard as well. Next slide. So just a little bit about my organization, U.S. Aging is the national association representing and supporting the network of area agencies on aging and advocating for the Title VI Native American aging programs. U.S. Aging, um, in addition to engaged, has a number of initiatives that can be found on our website, usaging.org. Um, we do things like administer the Aging and Disability Business Institute, co-lead the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center with Easter Seals. We lead the Dementia Friendly America and Dementia Friends USA initiative. And we also operate the Elder Care Locator and Disability um, and Access Information and Access Line Dial among many more efforts. So you might wanna check out our website, usaging.org if you're not familiar with all those efforts. Next slide. Just a little bit about Engaged. Um, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults is a um, effort. It's funded by the Administration for Community Living. We work to increase the social engagement of older adults, people with disabilities and their caregivers. We work to do that by expanding and enhancing the um, aging network's capacity to offer interventions that promote social engagement and decrease social isolation and loneliness. And much of our work focuses on identifying and disseminating information about emerging trends and developing resources and replication tools and identifying and disseminating best practices, um, social engagement program best practices. And we're also guided by a broad-based project advisory committee with representatives from 18 organizations and resource centers who help to guide our work and provide social engagement insights from their fields of expertise, which we really value as well. And our website is engagingolderadults.org. Next slide, Banal. 
What I'm really excited about is introducing the presenters today. Um, Susan, we're joined by Susan Frick, so a social worker and education recruitment coordinator with Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, Harbajan Khalsa, program director with Dementia Capable Southern Arizona with the Pima Council on Aging, and Janice Lundy, director of social work and geriatric care management with Perry County Memorial Hospital. And with that, Susan, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for, for joining in and being interested on a topic of how we engage people with dementia. And what I I'm going to speak on today is is a group, really a group that we have within the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, which we're one of the federally funded Alzheimer's centers based in Chicago. And we have a support program that we've been running for 18 years for people with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. And, and I work with people who are older too, but a lot of what I kind of frame as my thought on loneliness and dementia comes from things that both people with dementia and family members have talked about through that group. And that group has been running now for 18 and a half years, so a long time. So um, next slide. And within the group, we've, we were lucky to have many people help facilitate the group, one being a woman who is a Presbyterian minister and also an artist. So when she would help us facilitate group sessions, she would then make drawings and then eventually paintings based on comments that people had said within the group sessions. And our group is very large. It, when we, at some points when we were meeting in person before COVID, we were averaging around 80 people at a meeting would break into several different groups for people with dementia and for family members. And so one gentleman in my group um, said that to him, Alzheimer's disease felt like he had fallen into this pit and he could see everyone outside of the pit, but he just couldn't figure out how to get back to them. And he also shared, which was, I thought, interesting that it was a very similar analogy that he felt also like Alzheimer's disease was like walking on Swiss cheese, that he would be walking along fine and then have these moments where he would just fall into a hole and he would spend so much time and so much effort trying to figure out how to get back out of that hole. And then he'd walk along and fall into another one. And both of those just were so visual to me and talked about the loneliness that people experience. And and from our group, we've also made a, a documentary. And I wanted to show one of the clips from the documentary, a, a very short one, that showed shows a couple that we filmed in the process, um, Laura and Pam. And they were married. And they talked about uh, Pam talking about what living with dementia felt like for her. But then also Laura talking about what it was like as the spouse and that for her, how trying to balance Pam's needs and the, and the, the limitations of that. And so if you could go ahead and play the clip and then we'll talk about it. There are times when I feel like I'm secondary in this family and that Laura has all of the, does all the decision-making and, and, um, scheduling and and there are a lot of times where i'm fully capable of it but i defer to her and i uh, to be honest i resent that sometimes um it's really hard for me to take a back seat and that's where i feel like i'm supposed to be is in the back seat so there's times where i feel like okay i want to include her and I want to have her as part of this, but it's causing stress to have her as part of that decision because there's things that have to get done and I'll start pushing because we have to get a decision and then it's just causing stress. So a lot of times I'm trying to pull away that stress that she's feeling by just taking care of it, just getting it done. I, I don't know, this disease makes me feel like, like there's a that black cloud right over here, and that at any moment it could turn to thunder and lightning, and and it'll just, I'll just crumble. If you want to move on to the next 
um, next slide. But I think what Pam talked about is what a lot of people with dementia talk about, this feeling of feeling like they're different. And I thought her, I was there when they made that, when they filmed that, and her talking about feeling like there was this black cloud just hanging over her. And, and her also saying, I just feel like I'm supposed to be in the back seat, and that's where I'm supposed to be. And I think as we think about this whole issue of loneliness for people with dementia, we have to keep in mind, and I think we've become so much more thoughtful of that, but I think we're always having to remind ourselves what this experience must be like for them. And so the minister, Shauna, when, when making these paintings, added words that people were saying in the group. And so you see such things as left behind, lonely, disconnected, isolated. And that was often thoughts we would hear from people with dementia. I've had people in the group talk about one saying that she felt like from the moment she was diagnosed, people stopped looking at her and they would only speak to her husband and didn't treat them like a couple anymore. And she said, how, how frustrating. And, and you could hear it in Pam's voice too, of the feeling that she feels angry that she's not included and not part of the decision process anymore, um, or feels that she's not at the same level. And so these are consistent thoughts that we hear from people with dementia, of this feeling of feeling different and feeling isolated. The same gentleman who helped us come up with the idea of this painting, saying that he felt like he had fallen into a pit, also one time said to me, and I was running the group, and there was probably about 15 people with dementia in the group, and he said, you know, if you leave the stove on, people just laugh about it. But, and he said, but if I leave the stove on, I'm told I can never touch it again. And I thought, you know, that is so true that we get to make mistakes and it's not contingent on whether we're allowed to do it again or whether, you know, our self-worth in a lot of ways. And I think that hangs over the people with dementia, that that thought and that feeling is always there for them. And if you want to move on to the next. And family members have the same feelings of loneliness. This is a painting that actually came from conversation in our family support group, where we were talking about who was their social circles. And so the painting got named Social Circles. But they said that as they were living and caring for their person with dementia, their social circles kept getting smaller and smaller until it was just them and the person with dementia. And they talked about how they felt like people didn't reach out to them as much. They didn't engage with them as much. And they had feelings, and you can see the words a little bit in the in the copy of this painting, but they also talked about loneliness, feeling abandoned, grief and anger. I had one husband who's still caring for his wife. She's very late stage now, early sixties probably now. And he said, and I've heard others say this too, that he almost wishes they were experiencing cancer as opposed to dementia or Alzheimer's because people know how to talk about cancer. And people, he said, you know, if he goes, if my wife was living with breast cancer, people would be rallying around us. They'd be checking in. They'd be asking what they could do. He said, but with dementia, people don't ask and people just walk by. And so he said, you know, it's really lonely and that he feels, and it's becoming harder and harder for him to be out in public um, with his wife, just because of her increased limitations. And so when I think we're thinking about how we work as professionals in whatever capacity we're in to support the person with dementia and to support the family, I think we need to keep this loneliness in the front of our minds. And if you want to move to the next, next slide. And so I think there is a loneliness that comes because of the disease itself, because of what is happening to them and the, the damage that is occurring in the brain and the changes that are occurring for the person and then for the family unit. 
But I think we have to weed out where that loneliness is coming from. And there is going to be, as I said, the loneliness from the disease, but there's a lot of loneliness because of what I would say the world around them, the social environment, the family, the professionals, where they live, how we interact with them. And I think we have to think about how do we, in whatever role we're in, what do we do to support those people? And are, th are there things we can do to reduce that, that loneliness? So if you want to move on. And one gentleman, a person named Ron, he was sitting in my group one day, had Alzheimer's, and he looked out at everyone. And he said, I love coming here because we're all in the same boat together. And I think he really stressed how important community is. And so on the image here where everyone is huddled together and there's people together as opposed to the person by themselves, the, the waters are slightly calmer and the sun is coming out. And that's because community matters. And we have to think about how do we create that community? And what do we do to make sure we're working to, to connect people living with dementia with each other, with the staff, and work to create, connect families with each other in whatever setting. So if you wanna go on to the next one. And I think that really takes thinking about community. And we have to constantly think about in the space that we're in, are there ways that we can help people to feel connected? Whether it be we create spaces where people can share their story, where they can share their story without judgment. I've had one woman who is a caregiver for her husband. She said, you know, nothing really changes in my role as a caregiver when I tell my story to someone else. She goes, but there's an immense burden that's lifted. And because now people know what's going on and, and we support each other and we carry that load together. And so I think thinking about how do we set up those spaces where people can share their story and where, you know, they they can feel that they're helping to make a difference. Before COVID days, I did a lot of presenting with people, to groups of healthcare professionals, to community members, and I worked hard to include people with dementia in the presentation and the family members because they both do amazing jobs of talking about this and sharing what it's like. And, and I also felt like that helped to give, especially people with dementia, helped to give them purpose and a role and help to create the sense of community. And over the years, we've presented to and hundreds of people. Um, and often I'd have panels of just people with dementia. And it, it was amazing how well it went. And so I think figuring out ways to recognize and value each person so that they know what they bring to the community and that the community knows what value that they have and what the value the other people have. And so constantly thinking, how do I work to make this space feel like a family and like a group? And I think that's what you're going to hear in the programs that are going to be highlighted next is how you take that idea of we're, we're, we're dealing with loneliness constantly because of working with older people and working with people with dementia in particular. And how do we create that space where people will feel valued and feel connected? And so I think there's one more PowerPoint. And this just shows some of the links for the resources that I used for the talk. So the Without Warning Support Program, the paintings that are on, are on that site, um, our video, our documentary. And also I, I did a presentation on, for TEDx that's on the loneliness and, and this topic. So it's there if you would like to see it. And I'd like to bring my presentation to a close and now turn it over so that we can hear about two programs that are working to address this aspect of loneliness. Th thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Hello, everyone. My name is Harbhajan Khalsa. I am the program director for Dementia Capable Southern Arizona, which is housed at Pima Council on Aging, 
which is our local area agency on aging in Tucson. Next slide. So as we all know, social connection is vital. It is very crucial to those living with dementia and their families. I have a couple statistics I wanted to share with you. Social isolation has been associated with around a 50% increased risk of dementia. Additionally, social isolation was shown to increase the risk of heart disease by 29% and stroke risk by 32%. And we know that during the last few years with the COVID pandemic, these statistics have increased as well. Studies have shown that those who engage in social activities feel the effects of dementia less rapidly. So it is extremely important that we create a space for fun and connection to enhance the lives of those living with dementia, their family members, and their caregivers. Next slide. So I wanted to just touch base briefly about some of the services that we offer at Dementia Capable Southern Arizona and how they are able to provide social connection and social engagement. Uh, first off, we offer options counseling. So we have two bilingual options counselors that are able to meet with our clients. Um, we meet with people wherever they're at, um, in the office, in their homes, um, at their family members, via Zoom, over the phone. We really try and reach people wherever they're at. We have regular monthly or even weekly contact with our client. Um, and we make sure that we share opportunities for engagement. A lot of times there are so many resources out there, but not everyone knows where to go. So we kind of view ourselves as an anchor and as a hub so we can provide that information and knowledge to all of our clients. We have educational programs available. We have a community education specialist who provides a, a menu of trainings, um, some designed for those living with dementia, some for family caregivers, others for professionals and community members. And we really emphasize and reinforce the importance of social engagement and how impactful social isolation and loneliness is on older adults, especially those that are living with dementia. We also provide um, caregiver support. We have a family caregiving support program that offers support groups and one-on-one -on -one support, as well as we provide um, support to informal caregivers in their workplace. We are currently in the process of creating a dementia-friendly community. We are working with our local government, community partners, and our citizens to create an environment which is safe, comfortable, and welcoming to those living with dementia and their family members. And hopefully our goal is by doing this, we will increase opportunities for everyday engagement so that those living with dementia have opportunities kind of everywhere they turn in our community. And lastly, uh, memory cafes. So I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking about what memory cafes are, how we have adopted them in Pima County. And then I'm gonna share some, some tips and tricks that we have learned along the way um, if you're not doing them or maybe some ideas um, for other options if you are currently offering them. Next slide, please. This is just a brief video I wanna share before we kind of dive into memory cafes. It can be lonely living with memory loss or dementia. But you are not alone. Memory cafes are bringing people affected by dementia together at welcoming social events. It's fun. I am so thankful to have a place where my mom and I can go and laugh and just enjoy the experience. I've made new friends. They understand what I'm going through because they are living it too. Memory cafes encourage me to try different activities, which is really refreshing. You'll find guest artists, musicians and dancers, educational programs, or simply a place to relax and chat with others. These gatherings are free, and you can attend as many as you would like. Cafes are offered weekly or monthly, with options to meet in person, online, or even by telephone. Visit these websites to learn more and find a memory cafe near you. Next slide, please. So I like to share that video. I will thank um, Beth Salzberg and Jewish Family and Children's Services in Boston. That is a free 
video that is available on their website. I list them at the end of this presentation, um, but they have a plethora of resources that are available. That video is among them. Um, and so we use that video when we're describing what a memory cafe is. So memory cafes are new in our community. And so we, we've been using that video and it helps easier than me talking for 10 minutes. It really helps explain and help folks understand what a memory cafe is. And so a memory cafe is a social gathering for those living with memory loss and their caregivers. It is designed to be a safe and welcoming environment. It is not meant to be a support group or an educational support group. It is really a social space for those to come and to connect, to find understanding and acceptance. Um, no one is asked their diagnosis. People at any stage of dementia are welcome to come. And it's for their families and friends and neighbors and caregivers. So it's not just for the person living with dementia. Next slide, please. So this is a picture on the right. This is actually a picture from one of our local memory cafes. Um, but when we, when we talk about memory cafes, and one of the things we've heard from, from our folks that have attended is that it's nice because they don't have to talk about dementia if they don't want to. They can leave their diagnosis at the door and come to a place where they can make music, enjoy themselves, create memories, and have fun. And on the create memories thing, I just want to share a, a quick story because someone's like, well, if they have dementia, they may forget. And the answer is yes. And that has happened. Um, we had our cafe launch um, earlier this year and we had a husband and wife attend and the wife has pretty progressive dementia and they had a fantastic time. The husband and wife sang and danced and shared memories and had a wonderful experience. The next morning, the husband said, well, honey, how, how was the cafe yesterday? And she had no memory of attending it. But that is not stopping them from continuing to go. He had a wonderful time, and so did she. She was able to kind of let loose and have fun. And that's the whole purpose of these, is to create a fun and safe social environment to connect with others. Next slide. So in Pima County, we currently have two memory cafes. We have one that is at La Posada Centers in Green Valley, which is serving our rural community. And our second is Cafe at the Katy, which is in central Tucson. And that is in partnership with Senior Pride. Uh, we offer both of our cafes once a month. Um, we're planning on adding additional days in the new year. Um, now that they've both been running for about six months now, we have a core group of folks who've consistently been attending. And now we're looking at kind of expanding that. Um, but I have a quote on here from one of our, our gentlemen, Tom, and he said that he's made new friends. They understand what I'm going through because they are living it too. And so that is one of the most important things. And I'm going to share a quick video, but before I do, um, there's the gentleman on the bottom right hand side of your screen. And I just want to share a fun story. So this was his first cafe. Um, he'd never come before, and we had a local musician come and do a sing-along, and on the second song, I Want to Hold Your Hand, he got up and started dancing. And so the whole group of folks got up and started dancing, and it was just such a wonderful, heartfelt moment. And his mother-in-law was the one who brought him, and she said she had tears in her eyes, and she said, I can't wait to tell my daughter because she will not, she hasn't seen him dance in about 10 years. So it's just an example of what social connection can do for folks living with dementia. Next slide, please. This is just a quick video clip. You can go back one slide. Oh, apparently one of my slides disappeared on me. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some successes and some treasures. Um, and one of the biggest kind of takeaways that we've had in terms of successes for our cafe is that it has been a, a space for social connection. Um, our in-person cafes have been extremely, extremely successful. 
Um, we did try a virtual cafe and that was not the most successful for our community. I think at that point, COVID had been going on for about two years and folks were a little tapped out um, of the virtual platform. So we were really happy that the in-person was really positive. Um, music has been extremely helpful. Um, I would strongly suggest monthly planning and brainstorming sessions. We have all of our cafes come together, all the facilitators touch base on what's been working, what hasn't, um, what to do moving forward. And then the most surprising success for me was volunteers from our local university. So we have the University of Arizona here in Tucson. And right now we have four student volunteers who come every month to our cafes. And volunteers are a huge piece of memory cafes. And having student volunteers has been so positive and fun and helpful for us. Um, some treasures or challenges that we have had, as I said, virtual cafes were not successful. Um, if we have a need, we will try again. Predicting attendance has been a challenge just logistically. We have um, an event, right, and we have RSVPs encouraged, but that doesn't really give us a, an accurate head count. So each month we kind of have an assumption of how many people are coming. Sometimes it's a lot more, sometimes it's a lot less. So just being flexible. Um, always have a backup. So this gentleman in the video you saw, his name is Lucas. He was given a 24 hour notice that he was gonna have to put on a show because our previous musician wound up getting sick. Um, and so I would just encourage you always have a plan B, somebody that can fill in if something happens. Um, and then food and drink and COVID precautions. So that's just been something that we've had to work through given our local guidelines um, and the comfort level of our staff and our participants. So right now we're doing um, just very small beverages and packaged snacks and then things that people can take away. We're hopeful that we'll be able to kind of start offering a little bit more of that in the future. Next slide. So just a couple of takeaways. Um, one, I would strongly encourage and recommend if you have not connected with the Percolator Network and Jewish Family Children's Services in Boston, please do if you're interested in memory cafes. Uh, Beth Salzberg is a, um, is a gem and she has been giving us so many resources. She has a handbook and so much information. So if you have any questions about how to run a cafe or kind of how to get started, she has a lot of information. Um, have a cafe launch party, include your local media and news outlets in this so that your community can become educated on what a cafe is. Ask participants to bring a friend. As I said before, connect with uh, local colleges and universities for volunteers. And finally, this is a memory cafe for folks living with dementia. So include them as you are planning these moving forward. What I think might be fun or engaging is not necessarily what is going to be fun and engaging for those living with dementia. So at this point, we have a core group of folks that have been in attendance every month. And so we ask them for feedback. What type of music do you like? What kind of snacks do you want? What is missing from this cafe that would make it more engaging and more connecting for you? So really listen to those people in your community so you can tailor your cafe to what their needs are. Next slide. So these are just some resources. Um, our website is on here, dcsa.pcoa.org. As I mentioned, Jewish Family Children's Services of Boston has a lot of great information. And lastly, there is a memory cafe directory that has a list of all the in-person and virtual cafes that are happening around the world. So it's a really great resource as well to get plugged into for memory cafes. Next slide. All right, thank you all so much for sharing space with me today. I really appreciate your time. And up next, I will pass it on to Janice. Okay, oh, what a wonderful introduction um, to um, the intervention that I'm gonna talk about and just the importance of the need for um, socialization and and interventions that are uh, around socialization for uh, people with dementia. So um, 
Yeah, I am, uh, as I was introduced earlier, I'm Janice Lundy. I'm the direct official, Lee. I am the director of social work and geriatric care management at uh, Perry County Memorial Hospital. I'm also on a team, um, a core training team for cognitive stimulation therapy at the Gateway Education Center at St. Louis University. We've been providing CST here for um, eight years here at our organization prior to getting uh, involved with um, uh, about a year into that with um, uh, the group at St. Louis University. Uh, my colleague and I uh, actually were trained in London by uh, the original trainer or the original developers of CST. And are now uh, practicing, we have about, this is a, a group social intervention, and we uh, run about 17 sessions a week uh, here at our small, in our small community. Um, you can change the slide, please. If so just the learning objective is just to really introduce you to cognitive stimulation therapy, or CST, as in, uh, an evidence-based uh, psychosocial intervention for persons with mild to moderate dementia. And then also um, kind of help you to think about how you might um, uh, be able to uh, begin or start uh, programs like this uh, within your practice uh, environments. Next slide, please. Okay, so just cognitive stimulation therapy defined. So <clears throat> cognitive stimulation therapy or CST as we call it, is an evidence-based group intervention for people with mild to moderate dementia. CST provides guidelines for structuring small, themed-based group sessions aimed to actively stimulate and engage while providing the optimal learning environment and social benefits of a group. Originally, it was it designed as a group intervention, but um, and I will talk briefly, it's now being done uh, individually and then also since the pandemic, um, a virtual uh, version of CST. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about the background and how the developers thought about uh, prior to uh, developing CST was dementia was traditionally just conceptualized from a medical perspective. We looked at it as an organic disease where uh, assessment and diagnosement, diagnosis and then treatment was just really done by the medical community without looking at um, broader and wider um, things that could be uh, happening um, to, uh, to uh, make um, dementia symptoms uh, worse. So um, when Susan talked earlier about all of the feelings and things that people with dementia have, uh, Kitwood, uh, Thomas Kitwood really came up with something called, and some of you may be very familiar with this, uh, malignant social psychology. And he came up with 17 key things that help to uh, exacerbate the, uh, the symptoms of, of a person living with dementia. Things like outpacing, ignoring, stigmatization, those feelings of loneliness that you heard earlier. So he was really the first one to start looking at that person-centered approach and looking at a person's environment and those interprofessional relationships. Um, so when CST was first looked at back in the 90s, um, two uh, professors from University College London, Martin Oral and Bob Woods, um, there was a call at that time for psychosocial interventions for uh, dementia. And um, there really was not a lot of solid research around uh, interventions at that time. So they wrote an editorial called Tacrin and Psychological Therapies in Dementia. And from this, um, they were able to get funding to put together the, a, a package, um, a psychological uh, package uh, for dementia. So as they, what they wanted to do was actually build a program that could be compared directly to the drug trials at the time, and then also yeah, to, to get that funding. So from that, um, they, were, they were able to be funded and then develop uh, the CST program that, um, that uh, we utilize today. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, so what is CST? So as it was developed, it's a brief group program for people with mild to moderate de dementia living in a range of settings. So community dwelling, long-term care settings. Uh, it's 14, it was developed as 14 theme sessions, typically uh, twice a week for seven weeks. It includes um, uh, different types of sessions and I'll go through, there are 14 uh, themes. So things like word association, current affairs, uh, number gains, categorization. The key aims of the program is to improve cognitive functioning using, using uh, techniques that ex exercise different cognitive skills. And really this is achieved through uh, a, a variety of means um, and all of the different sessions um, uh, sort of focus on a different cognitive domain while multisensory stimulation and reminiscence um, is all incorporated and peppered throughout these sessions. And basically it really is based on that concept of use it or lose it, that the brain needs to be exercised in order to promote new learning and retain skills. Next slide, please. So how, how was CST developed? It was developed through uh, a systematic review of all of the current, um, uh, uh, most, and the most effective elements of different therapies that were out there, reality orientation, reminiscence therapy, multisensory stimu stimulation, and validation therapy. It was then put into all of the best elements of those were put into this 14 session program with, with uh, uh, themed activities. Again, it was designed to run twice a week for seven weeks. The, uh, with the randomized control trial, the large trial that went along with this, they found improvements, and still today, many, many studies around CST, uh, improvements and significant improvements after 14 sessions with cognition, um, decreased depression, and improvements in uh, quality of life. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to go through what CST really looks like. So it's a very it's a very structured program. There's an introduction, so a, a whiteboard with the um, the uh, day of the week, uh, the weather, the um, and uh, the season, and then everyone they each group decides on a group name, and then there's a theme song. They do a ball toss in the beginning where everyone uh, talks at the ball to each other and says the person's name, everyone has a name tag. Um, and then maybe we introduce a, a something like during the ball toss, like what is your favorite color? Or, or seasonally in the fall, maybe we might say, um, next week is gonna start fall, what colors might you see in the fall? Then we have a current affair where there's actually an article and a discussion. Um, uh, around this short article where it's just based on people's opinions about it. The date and time is always on the article for orientation. Then there's a main activity. And then we have uh, activities that we send, some cognitive activities uh, that we send home with them, and then a closure. So the structure is always the same. Uh, next slide, please. So the key, free key features of the program is uh, 14 sessions, again, usually twice a week. Uh, approximately an hour in the link. Um, we want to keep it at about five or eight uh, people in each group and run by two facilitators. Each session has a choice of activities. We like to uh, give them a choice and basically just catering to the, to the abilities and interest around those um, themes. Um, and we'll go through those in a minute. So and group members should ideally be at similar stages of dementia so that we can pitch the activities accordingly. And then we try to pay attention to gender mix so we don't have, um, you know, one, you know, uh, males or females outnumber the other or, or have one, just one in the group. So um, we try to pay attention to that. Um, next slide, please. So really the efficacy of CST is based around these key principles. So mental stimulation, um, creating new ideas and thoughts and associations, using orientation uh, sensitively. So instead of asking them directly those things like what day of the week it is, um, what the weather is, we have it on a board and we just have a general conversation around, you know, is this, um, you know, usual weather for this time of year, things like that. It's always based on opinions rather than facts. We try to really avoid ever asking people um, 
uh, what, do you remember? So it's uh, opinions cannot be wrong. So um, most everything we do is it's all around uh, the person's uh, uh, opinions rather than factual information. We use reminiscence as an aid to the here and now. What we know about reminiscence therapy is that people enjoy it. Um, it really taps into that part of them that's still really strong, but it doesn't do anything to promote new learning. So we use reminiscence throughout our sessions to kind of bring it forward into uh, the present. Uh, and then physical movement was actually just added in 2020 as the research um, you know, has gotten more solid that exercise and cognition um, are very much connected. So here we developed an exercise program and we're doing it before it was added to the actual program. So um, providing triggers so and aids uh, and prompts to aid the recall and concentration. So the memory board, always having pictures, uh, things like that are peppered throughout the sessions. Consistency and continuity uh, reduces stress um, and it, implicit rather than explicit learning. Um, stimulating language, all of the sessions are designed to put people at ease and stimulate uh, language, and then the sessions are designed to stimulate executive function. They're person-centered, respectful. Um, we make sure that we um, everyone is involved and included, um, giving them a choice, and really just having fun together. That's the one thing people will say, is that it is so much fun. Um, and just maximizing their potential in an environment where they feel accepted or, and are with other people who are having similar problems and just that building and strengthening of relationships. Uh, next slide, please. So why we think it, it works, and I'll just quickly talk about this, of course, that social environment and just, um, you know, uh, is positive and stimulating. It's always um, a positive reinforcement from, uh, from the facilitators and the practitioners, no matter throughout the sessions. Um, and then really it provides complexity and that diversity and novelty that is able to transfer into other uh, parts of their lives and improving their cognitive cognition. And then use it or lose it, just taking, taking part in mentally stimulating activities um, can create those new, new neuronal uh, connections. And then again, the quality in life, as we see their, um, their cognition improve, we also see uh, that their quality of life uh, improves. Next slide, please. So here's just a, an example of the session uh, themes, and there's 14 of them, and they, they, uh, they go from sort of more simpler to more, um, uh, you know, more difficult but, uh, as, they, as they go on. So just to give you an idea about the, the session. Next slide. So this is just an example of one of the sessions. So this session is session six. It's called uh, Faces and Scenes. So just giving them a, a uh, uh, at a lower level, uh, people are having uh, or more difficulty giving one or two uh, pictures of famous people. And instead of asking them who they are, you're going to ask them, who do you think is more attractive? Or what do they have in common? How are they different? Who is the odd one out maybe? And then at a more difficult level, you can actually ask them, you know, who they think the people are and to identify them in the loud discussion of people's memories. Next slide, please. So this is another session called Categorizing Objects. So um, at, a, um, at a lower um, functioning level, just um, giving them a selection of categories. And this gives the example of men's names. So so have them think about, you know, names maybe that start with the letter A. And so you go around the group and, um, and people try to come up as many names as they can. Um, at a higher functioning level, we would give them objects um, and then have them uh, uh, put them on a table and ask them to categorize them. Um, so for instance, here it talks about different rooms in the house or sometimes we do occupations and they have to will have, um, you know, for, for uh, different things that that occupation may use like a tool. So like a carpenter, a, a hammer or a tape measure, and then, you know, maybe a stethoscope and, and, and then have pictures of, 
you know, doctor or nurse or, or so you get the idea behind that. So, uh, but it's all done in a way that no one's ever put on the spot and everyone's sharing and um, we're making sure that everyone is included. Uh, next slide, please. So, and then um, with, there is an individual version and I'll just talk about this quickly. However, the research behind the individual version has not been uh, as uh, profound and significant as the group intervention, which you know just goes to show that socialization component. But it was designed for a relative or friend um, to uh, uh, provide the session with them 30 minutes long, um, three times a week over 25 weeks, and each session uh, uh, consists of, again, themed activities and centered around fostering that relationship between the caregiver and the person with dementia. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just key takeaways, our CST provides guidelines that they talked about um, for theme-based uh, sessions aimed to actively stimulate and engage while providing that, and this is, I think is the most important, that optimal learning environment uh, with the benefits of being in that, in a, in a social group. Um, and the key uh, principles are really the foundation of CST and providing that person-centered care, and that there's a variety of methods that CST can be del delivered um, and uh, around the, the group, uh, an individual version, and then also um, including an exercise component. Next slide. So here, actually, this is a, when they developed this, there, there's structure, there's manuals that were developed, um, and these are just three of the manuals that are actually available uh, to be purchased and that um, uh, go through the sessions and um, really line out the whole, um, the whole program, so. Um, it, is next slide, please. I think that's yeah. So, so to just wrap it up, uh, there is a uh, a training that is required um, for CST, um, and um, it, to there is a certification uh, training, and um, that we are actually having a next training on October the seventh. So. Um, you can go to slu.aging.edu. Uh, um, and I can also provide a link uh, to register for the training. So, um, Meredith, I'll send it back to you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for, um, thank you to all of our presenters. We thought each of you had a unique kind of um, perspective and set of resources on this topic. So we appreciate your time. I just wanted to share a few quick resources from Engaged in another effort before we move into the Q&A session, which, which will, I'll, I'll move pretty quick so we can get to Q&A as soon as possible. Um, but the Engaged website is here on this slide, engagingolderadults.org. I just wanted to mention we have a new and updated community awareness toolkit with a lot of customizable materials that I think are helpful for many local agencies to highlight the importance of social isolation and loneliness. So we hope you check that out. Also, um, while you're on our website, you might want to check out our Social Engagement Innovations Hub. It's an online, online clearinghouse of social engagement programs that's really there to help share and spread ideas about social engagement, um, best and promising practices at the local level. So if you are perhaps interested in um, enhancing or launching a program in this space, that might be a really great resource for you. But we have lots more on our website as well. Um, Next slide. I also wanted to briefly highlight another initiative, Commit to Connect, which is also administered by US Aging, just like Engaged is. And this is also funded by the Administration for Community Living. But con Commit to Connect um, really is focusing on building a nationwide network of champions at the local, state, and national levels who care and are committed to addressing social isolation and loneliness. And so it's like a free kind of sign on or no cost sign on process. And then you have access to engage with these other peers who are also interested in doing more in this space and engaging with each other. And there are, again, lots of kind of resources and supports tied into the work of Commit to Connect. So um, with those resources in mind, I now want to return to our speakers, our uh, questions and discussion. I know we have a, a few short minutes here. It'll, it'll go quick. Um, 
And yep, please, thank you for turning on your cameras. And I'll just kind of um, I tie in some questions here that I've been seeing on, on the chat or in the Q&A box. But um, Janice, there was a question that came in um, on, on the program you were just mentioning, which is, has, is there any information on the longer term impact of the program? And yes. if so, could you share that just in yeah, brief or so an access to a resource? With, yeah, so with just a short amount of time. So yes, yeah, so we have, um, after they, there's actually a long-term, what we call a maintenance CST program. And um, the research shows that improvements in cognition and quality of life, and it is, you know, it sustains over time. We've actually been providing it here for eight years. And um, yeah, we do, we do see people tend to be able to stay in their homes long, for a longer period of time and definitely the benefits. And after three months, they show an increase in, in their uh, activities of daily living. So, thank you, Susan. Um, and you did such a great kickoff to this webinar today. That was really great context. Um, I know Illinois, um, just with my prior work with Dementia Friendly America, um, all about Dementia Friendly Illinois' great work and the leadership of Rush and the Illinois um, Cognitive Resources Network. But I thought maybe you could take a minute to share about how how maybe the work of dementia friendly communities in Illinois or dementia friends um, in Illinois, how you see that tying into helping to address isolation and, and loneliness as well. Do thank you. Um, yes, I think both efforts uh, give people who maybe didn't think they could have a role, give them a way to to support people living with dementia. And I really, we've used dementia friends and dementia friendly too, to help people think about I can make a difference in someone's life. You know, I think a lot of times we hadn't thought like, oh, I'm just someone, a neighbor, or I'm someone who's in the community and I see somebody at, at the store, I, you know, and I think Dementia Friends helps to frame that and helps to give people an understanding that they can do something to make a difference. And so we have utilized those two programs quite a bit to look at the issues of loneliness. Yeah, great. Um, and I also shared a link to um, Dementia Friendly America earlier in the chat, and then also I just popped in a link for Dementia Friends for a little more context for anybody who's interested in learning more about those efforts. And of course, Harvagen's presentation talked a lot about the Dementia Friendly um, effort in the Pima area. This question's kind of for, I guess, everyone, although you don't all have to chime in on it. Um, but I think it could tie in for any of you. Do you have any tips or, um, we know people living alone with dementia is quite prevalent. I think around 20% of people with dementia are estimated to live alone. Um, do you have any tips on kind of reaching out and supporting their unique needs as well? Um, Harbajan, do you maybe wanna jump in on Pima with Pima County's experience? Yeah, absolutely. So that is actually one of the areas that we've been really trying to focus on over the last year um, is how to engage those living alone. And so we're actually working as part of our area agency on aging. We have a home and community based services program that predominantly serves older adults that are living alone. And so that's been one of the, the best ways that we've been connecting with that population is we've been doing screenings with them and also just introducing the concept of like what is dementia and what are things to look for and also educating those who are part of our home and community based services who have dementia on the different types of resources. So I would say connecting with existing programming that is serving those living alone has been the best way that we've been able to, to reach out to that, that population. Great. Um, and Janice, I see a few requests for that training link um, for CST in the chat. So if you're able to pop that in, I, yeah, I didn't think I, I saw the link yet. Yeah, I put it in. I just put it in there. Did oh, it, good. Everybody seeing it. And then um, also the um, saloon.aging. Uh, website. Okay. Well, I want to keep us on time because I know how busy everybody is and I have a couple of quick wrap up slides. So um, our first is, of course, thank you to all the um, panelists and everybody who signed on for this webinar. And there is a brief survey. It's It, it really is pretty short, but you'll um, kind of see it pop up as you close out of the Zoom. Um, 
after the Zoom close um, closes. And there's also a brief three month survey that comes out three months after the webinar. That's just part of our grant evaluation to see your thoughts on the webinar after a little just um, kind of spacing of time. So uh, keep your eyes out for that as well. And that's that's a particularly short survey as well. It should just take they both should really just take a minute or two of your time. The slides and um, power, the slides and a recording of this webinar will be placed on our website. So for anybody who didn't have a chance to grab the resources from the chat or screenshot or take notes, um, don't fret. There will be that recording and um, PowerPoint available. And next slide. We just want to have our contact information. And of course, you can find us at engagingolderadults.org. Um, my name's Meredith Hanley. Um, we also have a general info at email box, info at engagingolderadults.org. And we hope to um, hear from you. We hope you stay in touch. And we hope this webinar was helpful. So have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.